Hello everyone, this is William Gentry with the University of Idaho, and this is the Wildlife and Livestock Interactions section of Rangeland Principles. Conservation practices can improve a variety of landscape features for both livestock and wildlife, such as open grasslands, riparian areas, and forested areas. I'm Tim Copeman, a fourth generation livestock producer in Sonol, California. We own about 900 acres here. Uh, it was bought in 1918 by my grandfather and uh, great uncle. We run uh, about 150 mother cows. Basically, it's bigger than a hobby and smaller than a living. Uh, we have an abundance of wildlife species, uh, avian species, birds, uh, mammals, as well as reptiles and, uh, and amphibians that we're, we're taking a great deal of pride in what we've got out here. Today we're out looking at Tim Coatman's livestock pond for um, taking an inventory of what's actually in the pond. Tim's Ranch is a really great ranch um, for wildlife habitat. Through the development and repair of some of the stock ponds we've had, we've been able to uh, provide stronger, better habitat for the California tiger salamander, which is an endangered species both federally and at the state level. Uh, one of the breeding ponds that we've got for the California tiger salamander, we've managed that with a specific grazing program to make sure that we maintain the right size and height of vegetation going away from the pond so that ingress and egress of the little guys when they move out after breeding that can successfully get through uh, through the thatch and through the grass without being uh, prey bait for, for birds and other species. Not only do the aquatic features on the ranch provide good habitat for the wildlife, also the upland areas, the grassland areas provide excellent wildlife habitat. Well, to me, wildlife habitat is an indicator of the successful way that you're managing the ranch. So anything that you can do to get some help from the NRCS folks is going to help not only the wildlife, but probably your economic base and your function as well. On a ranch like Tim's, the primary forage here is non-native annual grasslands. And since that isn't our native vegetation, it has to have a certain amount of management to maintain as much of a diversity of habitat as possible for a variety of, of benefits to both the species, to his livestock, and fire suppression if you have that much of, of vegetation on your property. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to keeping livestock on annual grasslands in an area like this. We've developed a conservation plan with the Natural Resource Conservation Service in conjunction with the local resource conservation district. And in that conservation plan, we determined that there were some locations where we could add additional water supplies in the uplands areas and enhance our, our usability of the ranch itself. We see deer using those troughs. We see a variety of animals using those troughs. And the birds really like the trough. In that regard, we did put escape ramps and walk down ramps into every one of our water troughs so the birds can successfully go down, get a drink, and safely walk back out. Your local NRCS field office offers farmers and ranchers technical assistance for developing a dynamic and individualized conservation plan regardless of the size of your property. We work with ranchers in our area that are, you know, 5,000 acre ranches down to three acre ranches. They also have some funding sources that we were able to use uh, through EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. If you would like more information on wildlife habitat on rangeland, or other conservation practices, contact the district conservationist at your local NRCS office or visit our website. Managing livestock and wildlife often requires multiple use principles and it isn't usually a choice, it's mandated by law on public lands, but it is also most desirable for those also. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that you can't please all the critters at the same time, and management for one species will often compromise another. Um, the key is to focus on ecosystem management and making sure that the system as a whole functions properly. Uh, one of the ways that managers do this is by uh, using umbrella species, and if you're unfamiliar with the concept, it's that you can manage for one species and it has a positive impact on many others around it. So interactions with um, 
animals on the landscape are either going to be negative or they're going to be positive. And it often depends on the situation, the season, um, and how you look at it sometimes. Here we have a list of different types of interactions that animals can have between each other. And the first one is mutualism. That's where both species benefit from the encounter. A good example is cattle egrets and bison. The egrets eat insects from just under the skin of the bison, which rid the bison of a pest and give the egret a food source. Next one is neutralism. That's where neither species cares that the interaction is even happening, even though they're residing in the same space. A good example would be mason bees and pronghorn antelope. Both of them are there on the landscape, but neither care that the other is there. Another one is competition. That's where both species have a negative effect uh, placed upon them. A good example would be feral horses and cattle, since they utilize the same resource on the rangeland, and there's enough of them that uh, the resource of food resources for grazing is uh, diminished, um, so that both will not be getting optimum forage capabilities. Uh, the next one is commensalism. That's where the effects on one species is positive and the other one is uh, indifferent to the encounter. A good example would be wolves. That after their kill, they leave some pieces behind, which then the ravens and other corvids take advantage of. The wolves don't care, but the ravens come by after they're done with their meal. Uh, but the ravens really appreciate the wolves being able to provide a food source for them. The next one is antagonism. The effects for one species being positive and the other being negative. A good example would be uh, pretty much most um, pest and host relationships. For this example, I use ticks and elk, um, which the results are obvious. Um, and the final one is immensalism, where one species is uh, negatively impacted, but the other doesn't seem to care too much that it's happening. Uh, a good example would be domestic sheep uh, and bighorn sheep. Um, domestic sheep are carriers for pneumonia, but the bighorn sheep often get transmitted to them. Uh, the domestic sheep aren't harmed by the interaction at all, but the bighorn sheep uh, do end up suffering oftentimes. So that domestic sheep and bighorn sheep I just talked about lastly, um, there is that uh, negative impact on one and uh, domestic sheep don't seem to care too much, but it really depends on the situation. There are a lot of uh, pluses and minuses that are floating back and forth between the two such as management for uh, domestic sheep could improve bighorn sheep habitat or possibly even bighorn sheep not even using the same exact elevation even though they're in the same area um, and possibly um, bighorn sheep eating or grazing in areas that could possibly limit uh, domestic sheep uh, foraging abilities but like I said it's all dependent on the season uh, the exact situation in the exact area you're looking at. So competition. Uh, two species in the same place are using the same resource and it's often assumed that that is all that it is needed for competition. Uh, but competition only occurs if, and this is very important, uh, both species are using the same resource, example food or space. The resource is in short supply um, well, short enough supply to have an impact and result in this last step, which is at least one species loses fitness because of the interaction. Example would be losing weight, losing fertility, uh, reduced health, uh, reduced fitness, uh, things like that. Livestock and wildlife interactions uh, could potentially have uh, positive relationships, though, too. So proper management of, of these would uh, improve forage quality for wildlife. Um, Managing habitat and cover for wildlife could improve it. Uh, maintaining water quality uh, can be done through proper management. It's important to note that improving water quality is unlikely. It's extremely difficult, but maintaining it is a thing that can be done. Um, and often uh, an increase in wildlife populations, if that's what your, your goal is. Some species are uh, actually well adapted to uh, managed landscapes such as ranching. Um, White-tailed deer prefer forbs over grasses, so in a landscape where there's cattle grazing, uh, the cutting down and knocking down of grasses will give the chance of forbs to come back 
which improves the habitat for the deer. So, so some, some potential uh, positive impacts on the landscape that would have a good impact on wildlife are improved forages, higher quality grasses, uh, energy rich seeds. Um, some studies show that after grazing, some plants give off uh, more seed heads, which would be, and more energy rich seed heads, which would be more uh, nutrients for animals. Um, higher amounts of forbs, like I mentioned earlier with the deer. Uh, more insects. Um, oftentimes, cattle will attract insects to their dung. Um, better cover or reduced cover, depending on the species, whatever it needs. Some species require cover for optimal habitat and some require less cover, such as prairie dogs, they need to see far out. And some animals like sage grouse, they need more cover or their nesting sites will get predated on by um, ravens and such. Pronghorn also need those wide open spaces, prairie dogs too. These are ones that would benefit from the reduced cover. Uh, birds of prey are in that section also. Um, oftentimes grazing can open up travel corridors which could also improve habitat. Some potential positive impacts for improved habitat. Um, grazing, uh, so a lot of species require uh, or prefer a patchy mosaic of different kinds of habitat that are broken up and spread, spread about. Um, a lot of them don't like a super uh, dense, thick forest with no openings. That doesn't really appeal to too many species out there. Um, so grazing can open up dense vegetation canopies. Um, it can uh, improve areas for feeding and nesting and hiding sites. It also could encourage uh, establishment of shrubs due to that grazing of those grasses and giving the other plants a chance. Selective grazing um, can create travel corridors like we mentioned earlier, remove rank grass, stimulate browse production by reducing grass biomass and uh, using livestock to manage weeds and fire risk is a very important thing these days, especially with the increased cost that fire is um, um, consuming uh, among the, of the budgets for Forest Service and BLM. But some potential negative impacts are um, improper grazing, and it can reduce nest sites for upland game and waterfowl, trample nests, decrease water quality, disturb big game during fawning and calving. And it's important that uh, to note that a lot of these uh, can be easily mitigated if you just understand your landscape and have a good handle on um, where these fawning and calving areas are at and just make sure that you don't have your livestock out in these areas at those given times. Uh, making sure that you don't have uh, your cattle uh, running through a stream all day every day uh, making sure you understand where sensitive nesting areas are at and making sure you uh, and what times those are you know are these ground nesting birds nesting in spring so maybe you shouldn't put them out during that specific period in that area um, they can also reduce cover to high predators attract predators and parasites transmit disease there's lots of negative impacts but a lot of these can be mitigated if you just use wise um, practices for managing One thing to keep in mind too is that these ranches are going to come with human changes to the landscape that are going to oftentimes improve the quality of the habitat for not just the ranch animals that they're being built for, but these watering uh, holes, these fences, um, sometimes depending on the species, these are going to improve the quality of the habitat. Also, uh, large tracts of land that are not paved and aren't uh, having malls built on them are important to a lot of species also. Um, weed control is another big one. Oftentimes you'll see less weeds on properly managed lands and ranches. Um, and disturbance can often be uh, beneficial depending on how you look at it and depending on the type of disturbance. But um, in this instance, uh, it's more that the disturbance of uh, man on the landscape in a negative way isn't as obvious as it would be in other sites. This is a video about a private landowner working to improve habitat for wildlife with his family. 
Royce and Pam Schwenkfelder run the SS Cattle Company in the Little Weezer Valley near Cambridge, Idaho. The broad valley is framed by snow-streaked mountain peaks. From their home, they can see the whole panorama of the mountains, the valley, and their ranch. We've been coming here for um, quite a few years. Come up with uh, on the horses or the four wheeler or whatever, and, and um, we've always this has just kind of been our spot since we got married, and always looked out over the country and and uh, thought that if we could ever build a house someday, this would be where we would build it. It gives you good perspective, you know. It's 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 beautiful country. We get to look out on on the crops and the cattle, and, and uh, you know, it's just a it's a pretty place to be on earth. We love it. It's been a great place to raise kids. Uh, you know, they get to go out and get their hands dirty and, and understand where their food comes from and, and uh, ride a horse and, and uh, appreciate some of the basics in life. There's a lot of value in what you find that, in, that you do in life and, and, uh, and the things you kind of hold sacred that you learn with a piece of dirt. The Schwenk builders raised two daughters on the ranch, Kayla and Cody. Their youngest daughter, Kayla, left her mark on the ranch with an award-winning wildlife management project. A pair of sandhill cranes flushed from a pond when we approached. It's kind of one of those fun things when you have when you have the opportunity to live on this beautiful ranch. You can have five acres to do whatever you want with, and uh, and a family that's willing to give up the five acres to do it to let you you know make your dream come true. We try to create a place where there's shelter, there's water, and there's food. So just trying to uh, appeal, I guess, to all different types of wildlife. If you build it, they will come, and it's, it's amazing. You'll see geese out here, and swans, and you know, ducks, mallards, and uh, buffalo heads, and just a variety of, of wildlife, and it, it's great. She got a national award for it, and uh, she got some scholarships that came out of that. So you know, being an FFA wasn't just about having cows for her, it was doing other stuff, and, making kind of a balance on the ranch of, of wildlife and cattle. And so that kind of started the ball rolling and we just try to continue that. When I graduated from high school and went to college, uh, you know, I, I have to give it to my dad. He, he ran with it. <laughs> I mean, I come home and I'm like, man, how many more ponds have you built? An overarching theme at the Schwenkfelder Ranch is sustainability. Some years ago, they switched to raising Red Angus cattle a breed that Roy says is best suited to the climate and capacity of the land. In every end of the country, from Florida to, to northern Canada, there's a different cow that will fit in a different environment. And, and so we have to find a, an animal and, and the style of animal that would fit here. And, and so that's kind of what we're trying to do. There's a lot of things that the cow guys do on that ground that is a stewardship type thing because we want it to be good next year. We want to, to do it right and, and, and this range is a renewable resource. So um, the take home here with the interactions portion is that there are negatives and there are positives um, between all these different species, both domestic and wild. And it really depends on a lot of factors. The species of both the livestock and the wildlife, the type of plants in the community, the topography, um, cover attributes, uh, skills of the manager and, and the practices he's implementing. It's really important to understand that the situation is dynamic. Not everything is so static and black and white. So um, it's changing all the time. From moment to moment, there could be a positive here and a negative there. And that concludes uh, the wildlife and livestock interactions portion of Rangeland Principles, REM 151 at the University of Idaho. Thanks.